Uh, hi. Hi, Matt. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, how are you? I'm great. Uh, are you speaking to me from the Obama transition headquarters where you've just been named Under Secretary of State for blogger outreach or something? Unfortunately, no. I'm, I'm just in my apartment. Um, oh, that's... You know, I'm, I'm hoping there'll be some kind of secret blogger conference at some point. Well, I mean, you work, you know, you, you left the Atlantic to take this job at the Center for American Progress. And I did. then the Center for American Progress has become the Obama administration. So I've been telling everybody that your, your lateral move is going to pay off with at least, like, a cabinet-level appointment. Uh, yeah, well, you have no... It's more a, a question of me rewarding my friends, punishing my enemies. Oh, well, that's good. That's good, too. Well, I'm glad you know, I, well, I, I stayed in your good graces long enough completely, to, completely. to get some um, crumbs from the progressive table. It's going to be... It's, it's a team of blogging rivals. You know? <laughs> that's good. So. Well, speaking so speaking of crumbs from the progressive table, we should probably right. start out by talking about um, the possibility that Barack Obama has already betrayed... Um, the progressive movement, American liberalism, and all that is good and true and just, which we are um, incredibly, incredibly betrayed. Um, no, I, you know, there's there's some real um, <clears throat> angst about this uh, out there. Um, just, you don't to, want just to just to um, just to clarify for anyone who hasn't been, uh, we're speaking sure. on the Monday Monday morning after the weekend when it seems to be clear that Hillary Clinton is going to be Barack Obama's Secretary of State, and meanwhile. Everybody's talking about Robert Gates staying on at the Pentagon, and yeah, and Timothy anyway, and Geithner. so there's been there's right there's there's been right Tim Geithner at at Treasury, and and there's been a lot of angst, especially in the progressive blogosphere about you know why aren't there any actual you know progressives in the administration? Right. Um, yeah, you know, and I think uh, um, I mean I think it's it's worth drawing some some kinds of distinctions here. You, you know, for one thing, I'm. I'm the sort of core economic policy, uh, where I, I have heard a lot of people, um, you know, very upset about these appointments, but at the same time, th- there's no real betrayal. I mean, I don't think Obama ever, ever, ever gave the impression that he had some deep-seated disagreements with uh, Robert Rubin, Larry Summers' trajectory right. and in macroeconomic policy. Um I, I think the the idea that that my friend uh, Chris Hayes was was putting forward that there are like no liberals in this administration seems a a little bit mistaken to me. I mean, you know, when when you look at um, you look at a guy like Tom Daschle and you consider that he was representing South Dakota for all those decades, uh, he, he seems to me like someone who you know was always a consistently progressive leader um, relative to that situation who you know wrote a book about the need for universal health care who right. is now going to be in charge of health care policy um, you know I'm not and, and of course I, I mean a, a lot of these appointments are, are political and so it's it's helpful to put what counts as a, as a reassuring face uh, on your policies rather than, uh, you know, to, to get a bunch of people who are going to sort of freak out um, the sort of establishment in D.C. and then have them spend a lot of time needing to reassure everyone. Instead, you can have reassuring people come in and say, no, you know, we, we'd look, we need to have dramatic change. Right. Well, and I mean, I think that... You know, one one thing obviously that's going on here is the extent to which there has been a lot more convergence on, especially on economic policy, but on foreign policy too. But focusing on economic policy between mm-hmm. the progressive and neoliberal factions um, in the Democratic Party, and I think this is something that people have have noticed for a while. You know, I mean, Larry Summers can, you know, was it Ruby? It was Ruben who co-wrote an op-ed with Jared Bernstein, right, about what. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and, and I mean, and that was sort of taken as this sort of totemic example of how, you know, there still are obviously big differences between sort of between the left and neoliberalism, between, you know, Larry Summers and people who write, for, you know, and James Galbraith and, and, and so on. But the differences are smaller than they used to be. And in part, they're smaller because the progressives have sort of gained ground. Larry Summers is now saying right. things that he probably wouldn't have said about the need for universal health care and regulation and so on that he wouldn't have said in the late 1990s. Right, although, I mean, the other thing is just that it, it makes a big difference to have um, what at least is hoped to be a sort of liberal governing majority that, you know, when at the time when Rubin and then Summers were Secretary of State, I think the Clinton administration had given up on the idea of 
you know, achieving really big picture domestic policy reforms, not necessarily because they didn't favor them, but because the situation in Congress was not hospitable to that. The nature of the 96 campaign didn't provide them with a mandate for anything like that. So the administration was sort of left dealing with the issues that people disagree about, you know, the the minutia of of regulatory policy and sort of how – how much do you try to find a compromise with the congressional Republicans versus, you know, just just take a hard line against them? Um, with the prospect of passing big legislation, the stuff that makes Larry Summers, Tim Geithner, these other people, Christina Romer, who I, it looks like is going to be head of the Council of Economic Advisors, the, the things that put them in the Democratic Party in the first place, you know, a, a desire to see a stronger social safety net, a right. concern about environmental regulation, that stuff becomes possible. And you figure at least a smart administration will try to avoid focusing on the things that bring it, you know, split its coalition apart. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, agree with, I agree with you in the broadest sense, but... You know, I mean, the coalition only holds together as long as things are going well. And, you know, I mean, right. you, can, you can certainly see, I think you can see in the reaction of the progressive blogosphere to the appointments that have been made to date, sort of at least one potential fissure. And obviously a successful Obama administration will be successful and those fissures, you know, won't won't matter that much in the same way that, you know, the, the Bush administration, you could see in the debates over, for instance, some of his cabinet appointments the fissures to come, but for a while, you know, when Bush was doing really well and had 70% oh, sure. of approval ratings, I mean, the, you know, the fissures, the fissures matter in, in, in tough times. Um, right. But, but yeah, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's, you know, there's, there's good reason to think that at least, at least in the short run, and especially in the short run on domestic policy, you're going to have, you know, you're, you're going to have this kind of broad consensus where, progressives are going to be happy with what they're getting from, I mean, certainly from, you know, I mean, Tom Daschle going to HHS is not, I mean, I think everybody agrees on this, is not Tom Daschle going to HHS to, you know, tame the HHS bureaucracy or something. He's going right, to right, HHS right, right. to be the point man for a push for, you know, massive health care reform of the kind we haven't seen in our lifetimes. Right. But of course, you know, I mean, whenever election season ends, it brings into relief the extent to which, because the the policy status quo in the United States is so much further to the right than it is in, in other countries, that the sort of left-of-center coalition encompasses this incredible diversity of, of opinions, um, you know, even sort of on the unilateral spectrum of, of how far left do you want policy to go. You know, you have people who um, would be left-wingers if they lived on continental Europe, and you have lots of people who would probably be conservatives in, in right. those circumstances, um, when there's sort of, a, you, you know, in the, in the heat of a, of a back and forth with, you know, John McCain calling everyone socialists and so forth, you know, it's it's easy to sort of get together. Um, but there's really, I, I mean, there's, there's a big gap in particular just between the, the people who in practice shape Democratic Party policy and a lot of um, intellectuals who sort of participate in more of a, you know, a, a global left that has relatively right. little to do with actual policy making, but but a lot to do with you know sentiments of voters, at least some voters. Right, but I mean a lot. You know, I mean you do you know, a lot of the theory of the whole sort of net roots insurrectionary spirit was that it wasn't arguably enough to sort of you know get. Um, Hillary Clinton and Larry Summers and, and, and so forth running the government, you actually had to change, you, you had to, in order to change the policy, you had to change the personnel, in a sense, right. right? And you had to, I mean, you know, and this is the theory behind, you know, running running primary challengers to sort of, you know, insufficiently, insufficiently partisan Democratic incumbents and so on and so forth, um, you know, and... and, and Obviously, that you know that that theory. I, I think you know David David Serrata, who's you know big big net rootsy kind sure. of guy, who I don't often agree with, but I think he I think he had a smart post in this whole argument over um, over Obama's team, where he sort of noted that you know a lot of sort of a lot of the energy that was initially going into net root style organizations ended up just sort of going into Obama, and sort of right. Obama became this vessel for sort of. For, for the energy of people who, you know, who, who wanted the Democratic Party to move to the left but were, you know, 
weren't like that invested in sort of nitty gritty policy fights. Um, right. Right. And, and and so as a, but a, as a as a result, you know, you have. I mean, this gives Obama, I think, a ton of, of of freedom. I mean, I think that you know, there's you can certainly imagine a scenario in which any the sort of carping from the net roots is the carping of people who's who, who don't really have an army, whose army is sort of supports Obama. Um, right, right, you know, no right. Matter, no well, matter what he's going to do, for, for at least for a while. But this is why I think the the foreign policy choices show a greater potential. So for, for pitfalls, I mean, because yeah. one of the reason there was such a, a merger of kind of general left activism with Obama activism was that on the specific issue of the the war in Iraq and, and in a lot of ways on broader foreign policy questions, Obama really did seem to personify an effort to, um, you know, take down some of the, the Democratic Party establishment figures and... You yep. know, much more so than on, on economic policy, there was a real, you know, back and forth on this between the candidates. There was also a, a history of Obama's sort of initial top advisors, uh, Tony Lake and Susan Rice, having been people who signed on with Howard Dean in 2004. Um, and so... You know, there's a question of, depending on what kind of policies Obama implements, I mean, I don't think normal voters, grassroots people, are, are going to go to war over who becomes undersecretary of state for policy, um, right. for political affairs, rather. It, that's an enormously important position, but but nobody in the, in the real world has heard of it. Um, but depending on the kind of policies Obama implements, I think he could really lose a lot of his supporters. Well, yeah, I, I mean, although I think the, the, the counter-argument to that to, is that to some extent, the sort of the, at least the big foreign policy objective of Barack Obama's first term is kind of, it's kind of baked in the cake, right? I mean, Obama, you know, there's a there's a timeline for withdrawal from Iraq. Obama right. has has promised to withdraw from Iraq, and I think that you know if he if he isn't perceived as withdrawing, he's going to be you know he he really is going to have a revolt on his hands from within the party. So you know the fact that you have Hillary Clinton sort of responsible for with the withdrawal from Iraq, you know, it's not like Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State is going to, you know, re-support the Iraq war or something. No, I, I no, mean, no, no, no. And, and so there is, you know, there is some argument to be made that, um, you know, it, it could be good for progressivism in the long run to, you know, you have sort of, if the face of the withdrawal from Iraq is Hillary Clinton and Robert Gates, um, you know, in, in the same way that, like, you know, it was good for 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 the neoconservatives, right, during the run-up to the Iraq War, mm -hmm. that Colin Powell was the face of invading Iraq for a lot of people. Right? Oh, yeah. No, I, I mean, it, it depends on what the... Uh, I mean, this is sort of what I was saying about the, the domestic side of the equation, uh, with the difference being, though, that on domestic policy, I feel like um, the appointments have been accompanied by very clear statements about right. the, the policy agenda. You know, that... Um, you had a, in the Washington Post today, you know, headlines about Obama's new team and also headlines about um, $700 billion in economic stimulus. Right. Whereas the, the articles I've seen about Hillary Clinton coming to, to the State Department, they've said a lot about the sort of uh, touching story of how Barack and Hillary uh, learned to, to, to get along. And, and relatively and it is, little. It is a touching story, yeah. It, it is. No, no, it's, 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 it's nice. It warms, and it's, warms my heart. It does, and and also with Bill's commitment to you know getting getting this job for his wife, and it's all it's all lovely. But there's not um, there hasn't been a lot in there about like what it is the two of them talked about doing as a as a policy agenda. I, I think part of that is that most people assume that the the financial crisis um, kind of and the, the situation in Iraq kind of mean that, that not much of anything will be done in, in one direction or another right. in, but in national but security policy. But that's silly because, right, because right, lots because, of stuff is going to get done no matter what in national security policy. Well, and because the essence of it is that, that crises erupt. Um, and, and I also think there's been a certain amount of um, – obviously some people were telling me all throughout the primaries that there was less of a difference between Obama and Clinton on, on these issues than I thought. Um yeah, and, and, I, and, and the, I think I, I was symp I was sympathetic to those people, <laughs> right? And and there's there's been a lot of um, obviously to to a large extent that seems vindicated because if Barack Obama himself doesn't see 
a ton of daylight between the two of them. You know, I, I can't contradict him. But I, I have read a lot of, I, I think, revisionist history about the extent of their disagreements during the primaries. I, I've seen a lot of people saying, well, you know, they disagreed about talking to Iran, but their disagreement was kind of technical in nature, so they can put that beside them. But But there was actually... That happened to be the thing that, like, got harped on a lot in in high-profile ways. But they staked out different positions on kind of a a variety of issues, everything from uh, nuclear disarmament policy, policy toward Cuba, uh, things like that, where, um, you know, it's, it's not an unbridgeable gap, but there's a real difference between a president who thinks the country needs to lead a global compact for the elimination of nuclear weapons and a secretary of state who doesn't. Right. Um, and and I would be interested to know which they've, you know, which one of those things they've agreed to do. Um, right. Because it's, it's kind of important. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess my, my assumption here, um, and it's colored by sort of how I perceived Obama behaving during the general election campaign, mm-hmm. is that... You know, a lot of uh, whatever he believes in his heart of hearts. Um, right. I, a lot of a lot of the differences you point to were sort of you know they were clever tactical choices in the sense on on the part of the the Obama campaign that you know during during the primary season there was a lot to be gained by being to Hillary's left on you know on issues like Cuba on issues like nuclear weapons and so on. You then did not hear a lot about you know about Barack Obama's bold new Cuba policy during the general election, and instead what you heard about was his, you know, bold plan for sending U.S. troops into Pakistan, and you heard a lot about how he basically agreed with John McCain about, you know, about about Georgia and Russian aggression and so on, and I I mean, I, I guess what, you know, what's sort of undergirding my theory here is just my sense that, you know, Barack Obama is an acutely political creature. I think if we can say anything about him, we can say that. And with that in mind, I think he's probably aware that I, I think that it, in terms of in terms of politics, mm-hmm. um, you know what you know what what was the one place where you know where John McCain still had an advantage over Barack Obama? It was you know mm-hmm. sort of broadly on foreign policy, you know who's keeping the country safe uh, and terrorism, so on. yeah, and ter- and terrorism, and but and and I think that like I, I just think that you know for 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 Obama, you know, in terms of sort of where you know where is he most concerned about shoring up his right flank mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. during the next four years i think that i think where was he most i think sorry i'm i'm spluttering here a little bit i think both during the general election campaign and probably during the next four years most of his attention to sort of shoring up his right flank is going to be focused on at least being perceived as sort of hawkish and you know consonant with at least with the sort of Clintonian tradition in foreign policy and, and so on and I think that and that's my reading of you know the Hil- you know Hillary Clinton to state appointment mm-hmm. that this mm-hmm. is sort of the, be- the the beginning of of that now and now that may not make any big difference if and this is again where you know if the oh, next four years are dominated in foreign policy by the withdrawal from Iraq I think then in practice that you know that there isn't going to be that much policy difference between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, between what progressives want to see and what, you know, what what a Clinton-run State Department wants to see. I think the bigger question is, you know, areas like Russia policy, areas like, you know, what happens if Iran is about to go nuclear and so on. Um, right. No, I, I mean, because, you know, part of the, the issue there is, um, you know, the, the president has much less agenda-setting ability when it comes to to national security policy than he does on domestic issues. I mean, there are probably any number of sort of small bore domestic issues where Barack Obama has um, sort of left-wing views that would not be politically palatable that he can just sort of not put forward. You know, you you don't need to necessarily take a stand on some of these, you know, criminal justice issues, things like that. Right. Uh, Whereas on foreign policy, you know, to some extent, you get to decide what you want to do, but you don't get to decide whether or not Russia is going to invade Georgia next week. uh, Right. Or other kinds of things. And Especially, I mean, that's even in some ways not the best example because because that's a huge news story. But but lots of things happen in the world that are sort of not that interesting to Americans, and you know get dealt right. with on a relatively lower level, and it, it winds up making 
I think, a lot of difference, you know, kind of who you're putting in place in different positions. One I- interesting question that I've seen sort of different reports about is what kind of agreement Clinton and Obama reached about the um, sort of lower level political appointments in the State Department. Because naturally, um, uh, I think, you know, Hillary would like to bring in. Um, you know, her supporters, her, her closest aides, and then those people would like to bring in, you know, people they know to be their subordinates. But at the same time, Obama has a, both a practical and, um, to some extent, you, you know, moral and personal obligations to the people who, uh, you right, know, actually, who actually actively supported campaign, him. Right, right and, and, and worked on his campaign. And, um, you know, I mean, I think uh, there, there was a, a moment of paranoia last week that I that I caught wind of, where people thought the Obama people were going to get like totally frozen out. Um, that I think, you know, isn't going to be the case. It would be a really weird thing to do. Um, but you know, it'll be interesting to see where everybody lands. As one knows, I mean, if you read about past presidential transitions, including in the Bush administration, you know, those kind of decisions about kind of which faction gets which. You know, right. assistant secretaryship yeah. tend to not be like thought through all that well, or with a real strategy in mind at, at the top level. Um, the Bush was like within a razor's edge of having Dick Armitage be the deputy secretary in the Defense Department rather than right. in the State Department, which would have possibly produced a whole different um, course of, of, of action. So, uh, you know, it's it's something to keep an eye on, and that I, I wish I'd sort of seen more clarity on. Yeah, well, well, I mean, I think part of it, too, reflects, and you, you just wrote a post about this, about, you know, now now that the Obama administration, we can say, but sort of the Obama coalition more broadly, has absorbed so many realists, in a sense, mm-hmm. you, you have this dynamic, and you, you were making the point, which I think is, is a good one, that, you know, progressives are sort of upset about, you know, liberal hawks getting plum positions, and they're upset about realists getting plum positions, and you were saying that, you know, in a lot of respects, progressives and, and realists at this point arguably have more in common, and that, you know, there there may be, you know, it may be better to have a, you know, Brent Scowcroft protege um, right. occupying a high position, if you're a progressive, than it would be to have a, you know, Richard Holbrook protege or something. But I think that yeah. also reflects the extent to which, you know, I mean, this is, and, and this is sort of a problem that any political party would love to have, but, uh-huh. but, but you know, I mean, the, the Democratic Party, as the GOP has declined, as the conservative movement has sort of shrunk in on itself, Democratic Party has absorbed a lot of people um, yes. who would normally not be on the same side. And so you have this dynamic, and where, you know, you have progressives and you have liberal hawks, liberal internationalists, whatever you want to call them, and, mm-hmm. and you have sort of Scowcroftian realists all sort of jostling for space um, within the Democratic foreign policy tent. And, you know, I mean, it, it's it sort of worked to date um, because right. there's been this sort of the Bush administration to, right, to, right, right. to, to find this tent against. But it is, it is a pretty... It's, it's pretty unstable. And, you know, I mean, for the Republicans, meanwhile, you, Michael, Michael Goldfarb, McCain's former spokesman, neoconservative extraordinaire, just did a post about sort of, you know, he was sort of crowing about progressive marginalization, but he was sort of also noting how, you know, realists have sort of moved out of the Republican tent. And this sort of leaves the Republicans by default, you know, as the party of, of neoconservatives. Yeah, I, I, right. And that doesn't seem like a stable alignment at all, where you have sort of the party of neocons and then the party of progressives, realists. Sure, but and this mixed bag of everyone. Right. I, I mean, obviously, I think this is why, th- this is why, you know, after every election where someone does poorly, some people get, uh, have these, like, wild-eyed dreams of, of endless hegemony. But, but in fact, the, the political system tends to return to equilibrium because um, the bigger your party gets, the more diverse it gets, and the harder it is to keep everybody happy. Um, as long as you're sort of growing and winning elections and there are more and more jobs to hand out and the kind of tough decisions haven't been made yet, I think it's it's easy to keep a really big tent together. But, um, you know, I think if the Obama administration starts, uh, you know, stumbles on something or, or just has bad luck and, and starts to become less popular, you know, then you have lots of different kinds of people who don't necessarily like each other who will, you know, start 
maneuvering one way or the other, and people to whom the Republican Party is looking friendly, uh, you know, might might Maybe. exit or, yeah. or return to neutrality. Um, the, the interesting thing about, I mean, it's it's very soon after the election, but that the the Republican Party um, does not seem to me to have hit upon or, or even to really be, be talking in all that serious way about like which kinds of people who have become inclined to support the Democrats they think they're going to win over. Uh, well they're all you know they're traitors and quizzlings we don't want them. Right. <laughs> right right right. right. Um, yeah and that's, uh, that's what I say. <laughs> totally, totally. We're growing a new elite in our in our top secret laboratories, even as we speak. Who will? Who will I, I will thought con- I thought conservatives were place. against growing people in laboratories. Well, we, we make we make exceptions when it comes to uh, you know replacing Brent Scowcroft, Colin Powell, and and all the rest of them. Thought leaders, yeah. I mean, I mean, John Boehner literally said yesterday that um, we need to respond to the financial crisis with capital gains tax cuts, um, which has just sort of become this you know all-purpose answer to to every every policy problem um yes and it's it's not clear what the constituency for that is supposed to be yes it does seem a little odd especially since you know you're talking about you know i mean the the idea is it appeals to you know the investor class but you're you're basically promising right now to dramatically cut their taxes on money they're not making Right, right, um, and capital gains they don't have. Right, so so it does seem to have, a, you know, less political salience than it otherwise would. I, I mean, yeah, I, I I don't know. Do you you want to talk <laughs> want to talk about the about conservatives? I mean, I think we're actually now I entering do. we're entering the period that I expected us to enter um, it, almost this quickly, and now now I think we are actually entering it where. You know, the press sort of ha- has gone through this sort of spasm of being really interested in sort of wither conservatism and so mm-hmm. on, and there are all these, like, wither conservatism debates, and I'm participating in them and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, at a certain point, people are going to figure out that, you know, actually for at least a little while, the wither conservatism debates are only going to really be interesting to conservatives. Um, sure. Because conservatives aren't going to, you know, actually matter to the governance of the United States. And so the really, you know, the really interesting debates will be, in the short term, the ones that are happening, you know, the ones over, you know, personnel in the Obama administration and which faction gets power and which which faction doesn't. Um, right. So, you know, Right. So what what was what was my point? I'm, I'm not I don't sure. know. You're saying we should we should ignore no, but you know. No, but I'm, I, I'm saying I'm, in I'm, some I'm, ways, I, I I think that these kind of debates that, that play out uh, in 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 the shadows, so to speak, like like in the Democratic Party in, in 2005, right? Um, you know, they're they're obviously they're less objectively important because the outcome of anything doesn't doesn't hinge on anything, but the the maneuvering because it you know happens in the shadows. Um, is uh, is in some ways, and it doesn't involve people needing to be as polite, you know. Is in some ways more interesting as a, you know, to a, to the politics minded, right? You know, no one is going to even you. You watch this Obama stuff, and you know, one of the reasons why a lot of attention has been paid to like things certain set of bloggers have to say about different appointments is that. They are kind of um, in the business of, like, being rude in public about other members of the Democratic Party, whereas, you know, most people are, are all being, you know, very polite and up with people, even if, you know, privately they're seething. Right. Well, I mean... But, I, like, Mike, Mike Huckabee is seething publicly. Mike Huckabee, this, this is true. And Mike Huckabee did do, I mean, he did us all a service by coming out with a book that, you know, just attacked attacked everybody and so on. Um and you know specifically went after went after libertarians and you know so now the now the libertarians are all up in arms about Mike Huckabee and they are I, I guess you know it's well one thing that's interesting to me is that you know a lot of the feuding that went on in the among liberals um, after 2002 and after 2004 really focused around foreign policy and, you know, the people who were being rude to other people. I mean, you you know, you sort of developed a, you know, major career on being rude to Michael right. Hanlon, right? I mean, so... Sure. Uh, yeah, and, and what's interesting with the Republicans is that, you know, and I think that this reflects the fact that, 
you know, traditionally the Republican Party has been more united on foreign policy and more divided on, on domestic policy to some extent. But, you know, the feuds, there, there, there aren't any great foreign policy feuds, really. Right. You know, all, all of this sort of talk, um, you know, all the talk that, like, you know, David Brooks wrote this column about the traditionalists and the reformers and so on. Right, 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 right. Um, where, you know, the reformers are everybody from me to Ramesh Panuru to David Frum to whoever, and the sure. traditionalists are, you know, Rush Limbaugh or something, and you know, and then everybody right, says, right, "Well, right. you can have tradition and reform," and and, <laughs> then, and then you sort of go on, you know, and and that's and which right. is of course what the successful, you know, I mean, the way these debates get resolved in the end is that you know a politician comes along and decides, you know, he, he decides to pick some pieces of the reform agenda that he thinks will help him win, and then he publicly says this was a false choice, and yeah, sure, I mean, sure, Tim sure. Pawlenty went to the Republican governor's you know convention and. You know, he's somebody who's been branded as a reformer, but of course, he had said exactly this. He said, "Oh, it's a false choice. We need reform that's grounded in tradition." Right. So, right. Well, if you're a politician, all choices are all choices are false choices. Right. So, so that's that's how those debates get resolved. But, but I mean, you can see this sort of pretty clear, um, pretty clear debate going on. I mean, I think it's a little bit, you know, it's kind of a fake debate because it's like, right. You know, the the, well, it's not a fake debate, but. Part of the debate boils down to just like people like me saying, we, you know, we should just we should talk about health care. I don't care what we say. <laughs> Let's right, just right, right, talk right, right. about health care. And people who just don't want to talk about health care and want to talk about pork and earmarks and so on. And in that sense, we're sort of almost still like a stage away from the actual debate about what conservative health care policy. But, but I think that the the absence of, of discussion of foreign policy in this is is a, a little bit bizarre. I mean. I don't think it would be right to say that, you know, in a, in a really straightforward way, like the Iraq War led to this wipeout in 2008, because there's a lot of twists and turns along the way, but it was... Um, it certainly led to the wipeout in 2006. Right. It did lead to the wipeout in 2006. And, and the other thing is just that the the sort of redefinition of neoconservatism as the foreign policy of the Republican Party is, is a very new phenomenon. I mean, I mean, the Republican Party has been the culturally conservative pro-life party for, for decades. Um, you know, neoconservatives have been a kind of an element in the Republican foreign policy mix. But, you know, as recently as September 12th, 2001, I don't think it was clear to anyone that... You know, the, the Republican Party was the party of, of Dick Cheney rather than Colin Powell, or or even that Dick Cheney or that Dick Cheney views. was a neoconservative. Right, I think that right, right, right. Right. Yeah. No. 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 I mean. I mean. Exactly. So you know, there was this really novel effort to, I think, implement neoconservatism in, in a really thoroughgoing way, as as at the core of, of the policy, rather than as like for Central America, um, and it didn't work out very well. Um, and you know, since it's it's not like, uh, you know, p- people people remember, or at least they ought to be able to remember, like what Republican foreign policy, you know, was like ten years ago, or, or even six years ago. Um, and, well, and or have what the something Bush to say about that. I mean, you know, the uh, well, what the Bush well, administration here's, here's, said its policy was going to be like. Well, but also, you know, part of part of what's going on here is that, you know, what uh, you get debates when there are things to argue about, right? And so the, the the one thing that's happened with, with conservatives is like, well, you know, you the the big divide maybe within the party, well, let, let, let's say, you know, let's say there was a divide over the invasion of Iraq, right? Okay, but, the, right. you know, the invasion of Iraq happened. Right, right, right. There, right. Wasn't, there wasn't really a big divide, but, but you know, obviously there was. Sure, there could have been. You know, there, there, there could have been, and and that sort of, you know, and, and that sort of, you know, neoconservatives versus, you know, Realist slash non-interventionist slash right, right, right. You know, and, and so on. I mean, that's that can be a real tension, but it needs it needs real issues to sort of manifest itself in. And you know, I mean, what what are? I guess it isn't clear. I think among conservatives, what those issues are at the moment, because you know, and you sort of you sort of saw this in the in the you know in in the surge, right? So I mean, conservative, right. conservative everybody. You know, they, there was sort of, you know, some realists were against the surge, um, but generally, you know, conservatives sort of rallied around the surge and supported. Right, right, right. But and, you know, but I, 
Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, I just I, I think these arguments are actually though tend to be more about um, people than about specific issues. You know, so, I mean, I'm surprised that you don't see a little bit more of a, like, uh, particularly because th- there's, a, th- there's a lot of impulse to say that what you need in a situation like this is basically retrenchment. Um, and, and so I'm surprised you don't hear more people saying, well, you know, we just had as our standard bearer, you know, John McCain, whose adherence to conservatism has been kind of questionable, except he has this very neo con foreign policy. We've got Bill Kristol now as this incredibly sort of influential person, but who doesn't seem to really care about conservative views on, on other issues. And that, like, these guys, like, this is the problem, that in part they're – you know, they're, they're preventing us from doing what we want to do. Their pet policy ideas haven't worked out well. Um, you know, something like that. Like, let's get some let's get some, some real people in there. And, and that seems well, to me to serve... Except that, like, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, but John McCain didn't win the election, right? Right. And so you're not having... I mean, what's what's the debate about it? It's, it's that, you know, we should fire Bill Crystal as editor of the Weekly Standard, that, you know, we should... You know, pitch Fred. You know, Fred and Robert Kagan off off the battlements. I mean, there aren't actually now mm-hmm. positions that these people hold that, like, you know, you could say we should fire them from, right, or or, or something. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, to to some extent, but but yeah, I mean, I think on a, on a deeper level, you have a situation where you know the sort of intellectual counterweight to neoconservatism has sort of, you know, either. I mean, they it's it's either just it's well. God, I'm sorry. I'm sort of I'm sort of incoherent this morning. I think I haven't drunk enough yeah, coffee. You 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 have a situation though where mm-hmm. basically the you know the core of the Republican Party, in terms of vote actual voters, right, still sure. basically thinks the Iraq War was the right thing to do. Right. So you're not going to have some sort of massive repudiation of that. And in terms of practical politics, I think there are you know there are limits to how far a party can go in sort of repudiating something that was like the core of the party's identity right for a right. little while no, I mean true. no matter what happens you know I think that like Republican candidates of the future are going to be you know you aren't going to have a Republican candidate just sort of straightforwardly saying the Iraq war was a mistake they're going to say well you know you know it was had we known what we know we might not have done it but uh-huh, you uh-huh. know damn it you know Petraeus did a great job and brought our troops home with honor and so on or you know we were doing pretty well and then Obama you know messed everything up but yeah I mean obviously it'll right. depend on what happens what happens, in, what happens right. in the next four years but you know it, it isn't clear how much politically there is immediately to be gained by sort of refighting right. those those debates and then you know, I think you do have, you do also though have a situation intellectually where, you know, I, I don't think like conservative, I don't think realists, I don't think realists really covered themselves with honor in the course of the debates over over the over the Iraq War. I mean, you had, mm-hmm. it's not like, it, I mean, I guess it goes back to what I was saying before. There wasn't really this split over the Iraq War. You had the neoconservatives who were really enthusiastic, and then you had a lot of people who were sort of you know, considered realists who are in public office, like, you know, Donald Rumsfeld was not mm-hmm. a neoconservative, but no, he was obviously, right. you know, he was obviously enthusiastic about the war, right, 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 not right. about doing, any, right. doing anything. Well, and, you, and you, you had a lot of people who are conservatives and who seem to not be enthusiastic about the war, but who mostly seem to have um, expressed their doubts privately. You, right, you, ha- you have that, but even that, I think, is overstated a little bit, because, I mean, yeah, like, okay, so some people in sort of, hen- you know, maybe maybe Henry Kissinger was expressing some doubts privately when the New York Times... Or George Will. No, no, go back and read no. George Will's columns before the oh, invasion yeah. of Iraq. No, I, actually, this is, this is something I that I, I, I actually, you know, I thought, and this was a mistake I made, actually, in writing something about uh-huh. this a while back, I thought that George Will had been, like, sort of lukewarm on the Iraq war, clearly uh-huh, had some uh-huh, doubts, uh-huh. Didn't, didn't express his doubts enough, um, expressed uh-huh. them later, should have expressed them sooner, and so on. But, in fact, if you go read George Will's pre-Iraq war columns, they're not, they not, like, sort of a realist, expressing, like, realist inflected caution about the wisdom of the invasion. Yeah. Of Iraq, they're straightforward. Like you know, I mean, they're they're just sort of they're the same things that that basically every conservative was saying about okay. you know. So oh, there goes my to... so my hopes for a George Will led Renaissance. Of well, I mean, George Will. I think you know, George Will then turned columns. against the turned against the Iraq War on sort of realist premises sure, sure, and sure. made a sort of cogent realist case against it, but he didn't make that case 
at, the at time. all at, at the all. time when it would have made a difference. And then you have sort of, you know, I mean, in theory, National Review, right, is the more realist magazine, and the Weekly Standard is the more neoconservative magazine. In but theory. again, in theory, right, but in practice, you know, and there's also sort of a gap between who National Review is pu- publishing in their pages and who is publishing online and so on, and the online, I think you've seen this in some of the sort of, you know, people leaving National Review because they don't like the tone is taken, and it's like, you know, right, it's right. sort of who's writing in the corner basically becomes who, is, you know, becomes National right, Review. Right, the face of the publication. So, so there's, 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 some of, there's some of that, but there's also then the fact that, like, people, you know, like Andrew Basevich, right, who was, mm-hmm. you know, he wrote for National Review, mm-hmm. he was sort of a realist, mm-hmm. conservative thinker in the 1990s, and then he was sort of you know, radicalized by the Iraq War and moved sort of to the left and right simultaneously. Right, so he's, he's so far out of the orbit now. Right, that, and that in, it doesn't make a difference. Right, but so what? But what that means is that you know you have sort of the sort of re, there are realists who are sort of you know who are sort of realists and who consider themselves conservative and so on. And but there are people you probably haven't heard of in a lot of cases. Right, and right, like right, right. you know the people associated with the Nixon Center and so on. And you know maybe this is just I've a thing. heard of them. You right, you've heard of them. I, right, I've heard of them, but I mean they're not like you know. Sure. They're not, the they're viewers not, at home have right, not heard of them. Right, they're not. They're not at you know Robert Kagan's level of intellectual celebrity. Um, right. And 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 so it, I guess it you know it isn't clear. I mean personally, I think that you know it'll. I, I think that. I guess I started in on this talking about how there isn't this foreign policy debate because I think there needs there, you know there there should be one going right. forward. Well, I think you cannot have a. You know, you cannot have an American conservatism that does not have a strong realist wing. And I think a lot of the sort of smart, young, sort of neoconservative-leaning people who I know actually think that way, too. And I think you may Mm -hmm. see, you know, among the people who... Among the people who came of age, um, among people on the right who came of age during the Iraq War, who were sort of Mm -hmm. 20-somethings, I think the sort of old neocon realist feud probably won't be as powerful because you'll have sort of chase and neocons and chase and right. realists and so on. But for, for the moment, those people are not, you know, those people aren't having the debate because they're right. 28 years old and nobody's heard of them. Right. And so there isn't really, there isn't really a debate, and I think that's, I think that's bad. I guess I'm just sort of, yeah, I don't, don't. I know. mean, I guess this is my, my, my nightmare scenario, which, which it looks like you're, you're explicating, is that, is, is going to come true. Is that, you know, I mean, the parties sort of rotate in power. It's not clear how long this current Democratic, you know, majority will last, but, you know, it'll fade away, uh, maybe sooner, maybe later. And that uh, a situation is being set up where, insofar as Obama's foreign policy um, looks successful, you know, it it can be deemed um, to have been a success, you know, because... uh, through personnel like Hillary Clinton, it was sufficiently on board with the with the ideological proclivities that gave us Iraq. Um, but on, con- on the contrary, if it looks like a failure, that will be blamed on, on it being too left wing. And so, when the Republicans come back in, sort of one way or another, the the upshot of the sort of dismal failure in Iraq will be sort of the same people and the same ideas that were behind that back in power, back with the same. Uh, with the same crazy ideas and, you know, just kind of a, another cycle of, um, you know, hubris and, and disaster and kind of vague chastenment. But, but I mean, it's, it's eerie to me how it's like um, – you see this on, on Wall Street too, I think, to some extent. But it's like this giant fiasco unfolds. Everybody kind of agrees that it was a giant fiasco. And yet somehow no one on either side is really to blame and, and nobody is going to be – going to be punished except maybe Donald Rumsfeld like he single-handedly brought all this about with you know nobody else agreed with him and, and no one else was was involved on any level um and I and I find it a little disturbing I mean I don't think we're going to like invade Iran tomorrow morning but it's it, it doesn't strike me as all that healthy well I mean I think you know you you do have and, and this is where I get kind of sympathetic to populists of the left and right. You, yeah, you do have this weird thing. And, you know, it's not actually that weird. It's sort of traditional that, you know, right. societies have an elite and, you know, a few when disasters happen, a few specific members of the elite get discredited. But basically the sort of, you know, the broader elite stays 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 in power. Right, um, but, but this elite has actually gotten... Like, you gave the example of Andrew Basevich, right? I mean, so as, as a result of the Iraq War, it, it seems to me that the, the elite has actually gotten narrower. Um, I think, you know, well, that, that people like him have been sort of cast out of, 
you know, the, the conservative universe without really getting into the, into the democratic the universe. universe. I mean, not, not, uh, well, not I mean, they're, they're in the nation universe, but they're not in right. the, like, this makes a difference universe. Well, but I, I mean, I don't think that's totally true. I mean, I think, you know, I think a lot of realists sort of passed out. I mean, I, you know, you saw it in the piece about Brent Scowcroft get, trying to right. get his protégés into the Obama administration. That's a my lot, optimistic A lot of realists view. have sort of passed right. into, into the into into the Obama administration, and, you know, in an ideal world, they would, you know, be, you know, sort of... I mean, there there would be at least there would be some kind of balancing effect where people who were not implicated in, you know, what went wrong in Iraq would, you know, rise to positions of power and and, and so on. Um, but sure, I mean, have their own chance to screw up, right? And, and 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 I mean, I think in the financial world, it's a little bit different because you're dealing with something that's an even more, you know, foreign foreign policy is a specialized form of knowledge. Sort of sure. the modern, you know, financial sector is this even more specialized form of knowledge where it's like. You know, I mean, you you know, you want Larry, right? I mean, Larry Larry Summers was not like personally, directly, oh, no. deeply implicated in the financial disaster. But on the other hand, Larry Summers was a pretty powerful figure in the late 1990s, which was an era when a lot of things that you know, a, a lot of a lot of trends that came to fruition in the last six months uh, were were set in motion. And you can imagine a you know, you can imagine an argument that would said, look, you know, no more. Well, I mean, you saw it with you know Robert Rubin and you know his his role in the in the Citigroup fiasco and so on. And you could say you could imagine a scenario where you say, look, we don't no more of these. You know, we don't want the Bushies and we don't want the Clintonites either running running our economy. But then, right, like, but then what are you going to do? Who, what are you going to do? I mean, you can't have you know you can't have Mike Huckabee. Um, as right. you know, as chairman of the Fed, or you can't have Mike Huckabee's equivalent on the on the populist left. No, um, I mean, and I, I have exactly this mixed feeling about about Tim Geithner, who, right? Um, you know, he seems to have been a mildly dissident participant in the sort of Paulson Bernanke handling of this situation, right? And the right. handling he hasn't. To, but he, but what was his dissident? He wanted to bail out Lehman Brothers, right? right? Well, I mean, and, and, well, well, and, and, and I mean, there, there's a lot of ins and outs. I, I mean, so it's it's hard to say. And so on the one hand, you want to say, well, this isn't actually working very well. It seems like we should get someone who, um, you know, hasn't been involved in, in all this stuff. But on the other hand, there's something reassuring about the idea that, um, you know, a transition will will entail someone who, who actually knows what's happening. And, you know, I mean, if you right. ask me to explain what it is the government did for AIG, I couldn't I couldn't right. really tell you. Um, where someone who was in the meetings and maybe is a, at a little bit, about half an arm's length from the actual decisions that were made seems good, but it's but it's frustrating. Well, and, it, no, but, it is. It's a big it's a big <laughs> it's a big problem. And and you can you know, and this is where sort of Everyone from nation readers to American conservative subscribers, you know, they they get they get their energy from, and their energy, you know, it's 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 true. I mean, there is a sense where you know you watch like, right? You watch the debate over the bailout unfold, right? And you know, my my sense watching that debate was, you know, I read all of my smart economists left and right who all said, well, it's not, you know, it's not good, but we have to do it, and. You know, when the when it was voted down, I sort of freaked out, um, and mm-hmm. you know, watched the stock market plummet and watched my four hundred one k plummet, and you know, I was like, oh god, you stupid congressman just passed the bailout. But there is also something where it's like, okay, yeah, I mean, the people who voted against the bailout were like, you know, Thaddeus McCotter and these sort of, you know, these these people who are, you know, they're not, you know, they're not sort of as smart as Larry Summers and Tim Geithner and so on. And, you know, you don't really want them running your economic policy. But on the other hand, it's like, hey, you know, we, I mean, you guys, you guys fucked up. Well, right. right. And, I mean, what's Thaddeus Mikata going to do, right? I mean, plunge the world into a huge into a huge recession right, exactly. and financial what's panic? What's the worst that could happen? And, yeah. the answer is that, and the answer, right, and the answer is that, yes, there are worse things there are worse right. things that can happen, and it is in fact the case that, like you know, it's everybody talks about you know the global the Great Depression is is terrible. But as Steve Saylor said uh, the other day, why we shouldn't assume that the Great Depression is the worst thing, the worst right. economic crisis we could ever have. We could we could have a worse one. So so you know that's, that's why that's a cheery of, thought, right? So that's why squishy people like you and me end up being happy that people who are only mildly implicated in the disaster right. are still in charge and we don't actually want the like complete populist revolution but all right 
But you can see why people want the complete populist revolution, because, hey, we need to put some, you know, heads on pikes mm-hmm. and so on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think with that stirring... Yeah, is that, is uh, that defense of the elite. I think this, this I think we should we should we should bring it to a close. <laughs> we can bring it to a close. Um, let's hope it doesn't get worse than the Great Depression. All right. On that note, Matt, it's a it's always a pleasure talking to you, and Thank I you. I do still hope to see you uh, as a cabinet appointee within the next couple months. Me too. Me too. All right. It's All a right. deal. Talk to you soon.